Hey y'all, this is Troy Black. So I'm super excited because I've got my friend David Diga Hernandez on the video with me today. The Holy Spirit actually recently spoke to me and asked me to have David on. So I'm gonna go ahead and just read what I heard from the Lord. Uh, this is actually back on July 12th. So this was actually this month. Uh, I heard the Holy Spirit say, get David on. Was talking about my channel. He said to talk about rest, but then he said working from a place of rest and then the Holy Spirit said, but also the weight of religion and what it will do to you if you try to carry it. So I don't know if David's going to necessarily talk about rest too much today. We may lean more towards, you know, that that bondage of religion. But here's what I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to do for you as you watch this and as you listen to this is that I believe as the spirit of religion and the weight of religion gets lifted off of your shoulders, that the rest of God and the peace of God are going to replace it. And that's what I've seen happen in my own life. And I believe that David is going to be able to share some stories probably as well um, from, from his life. Uh, but I want to mention a few things before we jump into this. Uh, first off, if you're not subscribed to David's channel, please go check out Encounter TV on YouTube. So, David, I'm going to go ahead and let you uh, kind of plug that real fast if you want to. Well, yeah. So we have a lot of teaching and demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power on Encounter TV. I like to say that Encounter TV is Jesus-centered. Bible based and spirit filled. So you're going to get teachings and sermons on the Holy Spirit, prayer, spiritual warfare, the prophetic and other topics like these. But you're also going to see live services that we host from around the world where the power of the Holy Spirit moves, people are saved, healed, delivered, empowered. And so that's just a little bit of what you can expect when you subscribe to Encounter TV. Awesome. Yeah. And like David is legit, his channel's legit, and the Holy Spirit is definitely moving through this ministry. Um, one thing that happened to me recently uh, was, David, you actually prayed for me back in, I guess, April it was at this point. Um, and, and when David prayed for me, um, I, I hit the, the floor. You know, I got I, the Holy Spirit like knocked me over. It's never happened to me before. Um, and if y'all want to actually watch that experience, uh, I, I made kind of a fun, hopefully not too silly of a video about it. Um, that I'm going to link to below. What's really cool, David, in th that I may not have told you yet, is that after that experience, what I found was that it, it's, it's not like it became easier to enter God's presence than before, but it's as if like when I entered God's presence, that heavy weight of his glory came so much quicker, if that makes sense. It mm -hmm. was like, it was like, it's just, a, just a greater experience of his glory and his presence. And another thing I noticed was uh, after that happened was when I began to pray for people on my channel, my YouTube channel, there was just like the glory of God would come into the room, you know, like just almost immediately. Like anytime I went into prayer for other people so that are, you know, that were listening and, and I'm not saying that didn't happen before. I've just noticed a difference, you know? So I, I really, uh, I hope that you can take that as a testimony for what the Holy Spirit is doing through your ministry. I know you have, You've seen so many things that the Lord has done, you know, so that's obviously just a small thing. Um, but y'all, this just this this is uh, if y'all ever have a question about like what I believe about something doctrinally or theologically, um, please just go watch one of David's videos on the topic, because it's probably going to line up with what I believe. Ninety nine point nine percent. You know, so David's done the work. He's put out all the teaching videos, all the content. He's way better at teaching than I am. So um, hopefully y'all go subscribe to his channel and uh, check out. Um, all, of, all of the stuff that he's doing there. So I'm going to hide this banner and then we're going to get started. So David, what has been your experience with the, the weight of religion and the spirit of religion? Mm -hmm. And what did the Holy Spirit do to, to point that out to you and to get you free from that? And what's the result? Like what happens, you know, when freedom comes? And, and can you just speak into that a little bit? Sure. Well, first of all, if you don't mind, I'd Troy, I want to thank you for allowing me to come on your channel and minister to the people uh, to whom you minister. And thank you for all those encouraging words at the top of the intro there. And I do appreciate them. And you and I both know we always give glory to the Lord for the work that he's doing through his ministry. And you and I are just stewards of these ministries that the Lord has in the earth. And so we're grateful and I'm grateful just to be a part of what God's doing through you. And, you know, it's just a real privilege to be able to serve people in this capacity. So I don't take this lightly. I really am honored to be given these types of invitations. So thank you, Troy, my friend, for allowing me to minister here. Now, in regards to the weight of religion, I grew up in church. 
And I understand that when I use that word or when anyone really uses that word religion, immediately all sorts of different ideas come to someone's mind. So sometimes there are negative connotations associated with that word religion, but we know that the scripture talks about true religion and that there are sometimes positive expressions and positive religious activities that you can participate in. So depending upon how you use that word, it can either be something good or something bad. And I think that for the most part, when people use that word religion, they are describing something negative. And what they actually mean by this when they say religion, when they say things like, oh, that's too religious, or the weight of religion, or the spirit of religion, or the depression that results from religion, we're talking about an idea specifically that teaches that man has to earn his salvation, man has to earn in order to gain God's love, and it's sort of this workspace mentality. We view our relationship with God like it's a ladder to climb, and that when we're doing well, we're moving higher up that ladder, and when we're not doing so well that we're taking steps down. This results in several things, and here's actually how you can know if you're actually under the weight of religious thinking. A, you live in constant fear of losing your salvation. B, there's a lot of confusion around doctrines like the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, like when Romans describes vessels of wrath. Certain doctrines get twisted into condemning ideas that stick with us and cause us fear instead of revelation. Um, wow. There's another expression of pride where people imagine that they are in fact performing as they should and that they have earned their salvation, that they are earning everything that God is bringing their way, and so that produces spiritual pride. Uh, another expression of this would be this overwhelming sense of joylessness to where that joy has been completely stripped away from the salvation experience. So these are just some of the symptoms. I mean, I can go on all evening, and I'm sure you could too, in describing all of the various system, symptoms that come about as a result of religious thinking. So really, when we look at this idea at its core, the root of it being I have to earn my salvation, or I have to earn God's love, or I have to earn His pleasure over my life. Only one of two things can result from that. First, you realize that it can't be done, and then you're also at the same time realizing that it can't be done, trying to take up the responsibility of accomplishing what you believe can't be accomplished. And this, of course, results in hopelessness, dis dismay, this weight that you walk around with, this paranoia, this fear-based response to what the Scripture has to say. On the other hand, as we saw with the religious teachers of Jesus' day, when someone believes that they can earn their salvation, and then they believe that they are in fact accomplishing that task, that produces a spiritual pride, a disdain for your fellow man, a condescending wow. glance at people who are not doing as well as you're doing because you compare yourself to other people instead of comparing yourself to God's standard. When we compare ourselves to God's standard, we recognize that the fundamental level of the gospel message, we recognize that all of us have sinned, all have fallen short of God's glory. If any man says he's without sin, he's a liar. And so all of us come to this place when we recognize God's holy standard that we absolutely cannot keep it. And that really is one of the aspects I use when ministering an evangelistic message. You have to first bring forth the diagnosis before you can present the cure. So at the same time that this becomes something that's ultimately discouraging to, to another individual, this can be pride-producing in another individual. But both of these are expressions of religion, legalism, this idea— mm -hmm that it's performance-based. Now, when I start talking like this, inevitably, there's always somebody in the comment section, there's somebody who's sitting in the crowd, or there's someone who comes up to me afterwards and says, but Brother David, what about holiness? Are you saying that we can go on sinning? Well, the very fact that Paul the Apostle had to clarify this in the Scripture when he says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? He had to clarify that precisely because he had the same issue when talking about the grace of God and that people misunderstood it to be a license to sin when it wasn't. So, yeah. This is what people at the fundamental level have to understand. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that salvation comes by, by grace through faith, that when I believe the message of the gospel, that God imputes righteousness unto me. Now, here's how I would illustrate it. Imagine before you is a door, and you open that door, and then after that doorway is a long hallway, and way on the other side of that hallway, at the very end, there's a second door. Now, this is what I would call the salvation experience. This is an analogy that the Lord gave me to help minister these truths in a simple way. 
That first door is justification. Justification is a position. It's a stamp of God's approval. It is a legal verdict. In other words, when God looks at you, he imputes to you Christ's righteousness. So everything that Christ did on the cross was to exchange our standing with him. He took our place in punishment that we might be positioned in his righteousness. So all wow. of his accomplishments are credited to you. His holiness wow. credited to you. The life that he lived credited to you. The way he pleased God credited to you. And everything you and I have done, all of our sinfulness placed on him at the cross. So when we receive Christ, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So when I believe, and this is what they call uh, critics of this true gospel message, call it easy believism. And mm -hmm. they accuse people who preach this of saying that you can go on sinning without any consequences. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm going to balance this out in a moment. So this first door is righteousness, that position in which I stand. It's a declaration of God. It's, it, it is to have my sins wiped away where the scripture says that he doesn't deal with us according to our wrongdoing. He doesn't deal with us according to our sin. And this is the wonderful message of the gospel. But it'll first make you miserable before it will set you free. <laughs> first, you have to realize I can't do this. All of mm -hmm. my righteousness added up is like filthy rags. There's nothing I could ever do to accomplish anything that would even come near to having me meet God's standards. So ultimately, I have to rely on what Jesus did. So that is what salvation is, that, that we believe in our heart. And when we believe that, when we truly come to faith, when we truly come to acknowledge what he accomplished on that cross, we are credited because of that faith with what Christ did, what he accomplished in his life. Now, this is where it gets interesting. That justification, that position in which I stand, is that first door. Now, we can debate all day about whether or not you can go in and out of that door. Some believe you can lose your salvation. Others believe you cannot. And I say, honestly, at least the debate doesn't matter because in practical application, we all are really, really saying the same things, but with semantics. So, for example, right. let's say I'm someone who believes that you can lose your salvation. And I watch a man come to church, give his life to the Lord, start to live morally upright, leave the church, go back into his sin, and find himself in his original state. As someone who believes, if someone were to believe that you can lose your salvation, they would look at that man and they would say, well, he lost his salvation. Whereas someone who believes that once you're saved, you're always saved, would look at that same man and he would say, well, he was never saved in the first place. But they both agree on the fact that the man needs Jesus. He needs to repent right. of his sins yeah. and the way that he's living is wrong. So if we want to debate Debate it to show how much we think we know about the Bible. That's wonderful. But I find that these debates don't really ever settle anything. And yeah. we, we are not the judges. Thank God we're not the judges because we're constantly debating about these issues anyway. So let's not get into that right now. That's a whole different message for a whole different time, whether or not you can go in and out of that door of justification. Okay, that I'm not saying yes or no, because I don't want to distract from the main point that I'm making. And that is the, the way that salvation works. So that first door is justification. It comes when I believe, when I receive this free gift through believing in what Christ accomplished on the cross. Now, I shut that door behind me, and now I'm in the hallway. What is that hallway? That hallway is sanctification. Justification is my position. Sanctification mm. is my process. Wow. Now, here's where many believers make the mistake of falling into paranoia. Here's where many believers become discouraged, and they never experience the joy of their salvation. Here, here's, here's what I realized that really set me free. Again, I grew up in church, and it took me a while to capture this reality. Most people do not experience the joy of their salvation because they do not recognize the assurance of their salvation. Mm. And because they are not assured of their salvation, they can't enjoy it. Yeah. They're constantly looking over their shoulder, wondering if their last mistake was their final one. And they imagine that maybe God loves me, but he doesn't like me. Perhaps I'm hanging by a thread and everything I'm doing is being harshly criticized. And he's folding his arms and looking over the balconies of heaven at me and saying, you're right there. One more mistake from you mm -hmm. and you're out of here. And this is where we look at God and imagine that he's just barely tolerating us, barely putting up with us, that we are just so, uh, yes, we are unworthy to receive that grace but his grace is so bountiful that he remains wow. with us and he abides, the Holy Spirit abides even with the one who is struggling. What sense would it make for God to remove from you your only chance at being holy as a punishment for not being holy? 
I yeah. mean, it's just nonsensical <laughs> for God to look down and say, oh, you're not living holy? Well, now let me remove from you the power to live holy. It's not like he's going to remove his Holy Spirit from you just because you're struggling. Right. In fact, the very fact that you're struggling is proof that the Holy Spirit lives in you. Because the mm -hmm. book of Galatians tells me that it's the Spirit that resists the sin nature. So if I'm struggling, who is there in me struggling against the sin but the Holy Spirit? So that struggle is proof that there are there are to some degree, and I don't necessarily believe you have two natures as a whole different message for a whole different time, but there is this very real struggle that we all face from day to day. So some people get this confused and they think that no matter where they are, that, that if they take a step forward and then a couple steps back in their sanctification, they mistake a step back in the hallway for a step out the door. Wow. That first door being justification. And so they visualize their life like it's just salvation hanging by a thread. Mm. And they're constantly worried that that last mistake. And then it, and then this, this type of thinking, by the way, is what gives rise to questions that are predicated upon presumptions that are not biblical. So when mm -hmm. you question a question, you open the questioner up to their assumptions. I'll give you an example of how this looks. Where someone might ask, well, what if there's a sin that I didn't remember that I committed because people sin all the time. We shouldn't. And I'm going to get, again, I'm going to get to that in a moment. So I'm not preaching e easy believism, nor am I saying that you can go on sinning. So don't anyone dare say that I'm saying that. Um, but we're going to get to that in a moment. We'll balance this out. But someone might look at somebody and say, well, you know, you, you forgot about that particular sin. You forgot to confess it. And therefore, you're not going to make it to heaven. Well, okay, wait a minute. Was it the cross that saved me or a good memory? Was it the cross yeah. that saved me or was it uh, an, uh, my ability to keep good records of all the wrongdoing that I've ever committed in my life? Also, another question they might ask is, well, let's say, for example, a man is driving down the road and he looks on the side of the road at a woman and he's looking at her with lust in his heart. And he's so distracted by this woman that he runs a red light and he's hit by a car and he's instantly taken out. Well, you know, the last thing he did was sin. So he probably ends up in hell. Right. Well, wait a minute. Was it the cross that saves you or is it good timing? So now it's not just good enough that I believe. Now it's not just good enough that the cross set me free or that the cross is what purchased my righteousness. But no, now it's Christ plus good timing. Right. It's Christ plus good memory. And right. all of this stems from fear. And then watch this, Troy. This is how deceptively evil these types of mindsets are. This is how tricky the enemy is because now these mindsets will work to defend themselves mm. with fear-based questions like, well, what about holiness? And, and, and see, when someone asks a question, what about holiness, when you're talking about grace, what they're really saying is, well, isn't it really our performance? Isn't right. it really how well we do? But here's the reality. Good works do not produce salvation, but true salvation is what produces good works. Wow. Good works are not the cause of salvation, Good works are the indicators of salvation. So in the book of James, yeah. the Bible makes it clear that faith without works is dead. The Bible makes it clear over and over and over again that if you participate in certain sins unrepentant, consistently, it becomes a lifestyle that you'll not inherit the kingdom of God. Yes, there are consequences to sin. Mm -hmm. Yes, sin will destroy your life. Yes, God will still judge your wrongdoing. Yes, there is punishment. That's a fact. I'm not saying you should go on sinning, but we have to understand the place of right living. We don't live right to be saved. We live right because we are saved. We don't live holy to try to please God. We live holy or we don't we don't live holy to try to earn salvation. We live holy because we've earned salvation and it's our offering back to him. We say, thank you for saving me. Now, here is my offering back to you. That's why the scripture calls it your reasonable service. In other words, after all he's done for you, he set you free, he saved you. Shouldn't you live holy and righteous? Now, yeah. the problem really solves itself because again, the religious mind will be, well, well, you can't tell people that. That's too good of a message. That sounds too good to be true. Um, but it is that good. That is the yeah. gospel. Because if it was any more complicated, we'd mess it up. It's this simple, and we already complicate it. So again, I am not saying that you can go on sinning. I'm not saying sin doesn't have consequence. I'm not even saying that a Christian can go on living in unrepentant sin and still be considered a true Christian. That's 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 a real dangerous place to be. I'm not going to necessarily say here's specifically where I draw the line. I think it's a case-by-case -case scenario for the life right. of each individual. But the reality is that sin does have heavy consequences. But, but you see... 
we have to put holiness in its right place because if I'm saved by my own holiness, then I just saved myself. So mm -hmm. again, to bring this all together, to tie together the threads of all of these different doctrines, we come back to this hallway scenario. So I'm in that process of sanctification. The true believer isn't perfect. The true believer is being perfected. The true believer is submitted to the process. If you're a true believer, a new creation in Christ, you're going to have new desires and you're going to desire holiness. Mm -hmm. If you're a new creation in Christ, that holiness is going to begin to come out of you, out of your new nature. You see, first he transforms the nature through salvation, and then out of that transformed nature comes good works. But see, good works don't cause the new nature. The new nature causes good works. And so it's understanding this subtle difference that actually brings about this trust in what God has done, this assurance, this blessed joy that comes from knowing if I just put my trust in him, he will renew me, recreate me, and give me new desires. So it's not trying to earn my way to God. It's God having come to me, transform my nature when I believed, and out of that transformation now comes this new lifestyle of holiness. So if you look at an individual and they're doing nothing but sinning, they don't care, they're unrepentant, they're going on in that way, I'd say that person probably didn't experience the salvation of the cross because if they did, they'd be given these new desires. Now, I'm mm -hmm. not saying that Christians don't struggle. There are some people who find themselves um, in addictive behaviors and habitual sin that um, they're trying to get rid of. And I, I think that there's some deliverance that needs to take place there, of course. Um, so right. we're not saying that that there's there has to be absolute perfection, otherwise you're out. But it's important to understand the place of holiness and the place of your offering toward God. Now, you're moving through this hallway. That's your process, sanctification. At the very end, at the door, that's the final door. That's glorification. That's the promise. That's perfection. So position, process, perfection. First, you're positioned in righteousness. You are justified. And because of your position being justified, you can now begin to walk in the spirit in your process mm. of sanctification. And then yeah. one day you'll reach glorification. But in that hallway, there may be a day you take a step backwards. There may be some days where you take 10 steps forward, but as long as you're in the process, don't worry about the position. And so this is where religious mindset uh, sets are rooted in this, this kind of on again, off again, on again, off again, salvation experience. And that's just no way to live. And I have found Troy, I found this to be true that when you believe the gospel for what it is, when you understand the fullness, the goodness of the gospel, it's actually so liberating that it produces mm -hmm. a desire for holiness. Some people are right. so afraid. You can't tell them it's that easy because if you do, then they're going to go on sinning. Well, if they go on mm -hmm. sinning, they didn't experience salvation. But if they truly do experience salvation, this produces the power to live right. When you begin to approach it knowing that God has forgiven you, that you really are set free from your past, that your sins really have been covered. My goodness, this just gets you out of it. I mean, I'll use this as an example. Uh, let's say someone has a problem with debt, a credit card issue. Well, when they're in debt, it's much easier just be in debt. You know, I'm already, let's say somebody says, well, I'm already, you know, $10,000 in debt. What's another $30? What's another $100? What's another 50 bucks? But when that debt is paid off and they come out of it, I've seen this time and time again. The debt is paid off. They come out of it. Now that they have their fresh start, they want to begin to implement new patterns, new ways of being. Right. And of course, that analogy can be only pushed so far, but it just illustrates that small point I'm making in that when you are forgiven, it produces this desire to do right. When you've come to know his goodness, it produces this boldness to say, well, I really can do this. Well, it doesn't entirely depend on me. He's already done the work. So I just have to walk this out. I just have to walk in holiness. So coming back to this now, and then I'm sure we'll get into uh, some other aspects of this, but I'm just kind of covering the foundational truths around how people get this all mixed up. So here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you can go on sinning. I'm not saying that sin doesn't have consequence. I'm not saying that true believers will make a practice of sinning. In fact, the scripture says that they wouldn't do that because of the new nature in them. What mm -hmm. I am saying is there's a difference between a lifestyle of unrepentant sin where you embrace it without trying to turn it around and working out 
that holiness, working out that salvation, or at least working the power of that salvation to overcome wrongdoing, to where now you're actually attempting, you're trying. That desire in you for holiness, that attempt in you to meet God's standards, that is a part of what comes when you experience the new nature that is brought about through the salvation experience. Wow, David, I love that so much. Man, that, that is an amazing foundation. I, and what you're saying about the assurance that we can have, you know, the like experiencing the joy of our salvation, I honestly believe that's where the rest comes in, you know, because mm -hmm. when you have that assurance that, okay, even if I mess up, you know, not obviously not, again, saying the same thing you're saying, not saying that we should willfully sin, you know, right. even if I stumble along the way, even if I take a step back, I have the assurance of God's hand on my life, that he's holding me in his hand. I have that assurance that it's based on what Jesus did at the cross, not based on what I'm doing right now, you know, and, and still obviously with everything you said <laughs> still being the case, uh, you, you can rest, you know, you, you can, it's, it's like what Paul talks about. I believe if, if Paul's a writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter four, mm -hmm. you know, where it's like you enter the believers rest and it's like, there's this joy, you know, and the word talks about how like the joy of the Lord is our strength. And it's like, you now have strength to work and do the good works that God has prepared for you out of that rest, you know, that that's wrapped up in the assurance and the joy of the Lord, the joy of your salvation, that joy becomes the strength where you just get up. You know, you reminded me of what happened to me the morning after I met the Lord in college like my sophomore year in college where the Holy Spirit began to speak to me for the first time. And before that, for nine months, I had gone through a season of just severe depression because nine months before that, I like sincerely repented to the Lord, you know, for my sins. And I was like, Lord, this is what I'm, I'm trapped in. I'm so sorry. Help me to get free of this. You know, it's like I had the understanding of the fear of the Lord and, and his standard. But then it took nine months for me to understand what Jesus had done. And so mm -hmm. for nine months, I had that weight. Uh, I had to carry it myself. And I was thinking, I have to change myself. And then I have to make up for everything I've done. You know, it was like so, so depressing. And then when the Holy Spirit began to explain the gospel to me, you know, what exactly as I'd been reading it in the scriptures and, I, and the light bulb came on, I woke up the next morning and there was so much joy in my heart mm -hmm. that sins fell off of me. You know, the addiction to pornography. The addiction to to lying and and manipulating people and lust things like that it was like i woke up the next morning and it was like wow that temptation is gone you know and i'm not saying the devil hasn't you know obviously tried to attack me in those ways since then but it's like it was like it was a natural response you know to the joy it was it was like something inside of me had transformed and instead of you know i like to say it this way it's like there was a whole uh you know that all these other things are trying to fill in my heart. And when God filled that hole with the, the Holy Spirit and the fulfillment that his presence brings, it was like, I didn't need those things anymore. You know, it was like, I have him. I have joy. I have assurance. I have his love. And now it's like, I don't need these things anymore. But yeah, it was, it was uh, man, I, the most restful place I've ever been in my life. It's amazing that the connection between hope and holiness is often lost on people. There's nothing more discouraging than something that you imagine is insurmountable. So if somebody right. believes that their sins are just piled up against them, that God's holding a long list against them, that they're just going to keep messing up the rest of their lives and never really earn their salvation, well, they're going to say, well, forget it then. I might as well just have as much fun as I can here and now. And that's why I think it's so twisted where people say things like, you can't tell them about grace because that's going to encourage them to sin. When it's exactly the opposite, when you truly believe that you're, you're just this, that, that, that you can't ever overcome your wrongdoing, that the list is just getting longer and longer and nothing's being taken off that list, you say, well, forget it then. Why, why am I right. even going to attempt this if, if, if I'm just always hanging by a thread and I'm just one mistake away? I, most likely, I'm not going to make it. I might as well just go into the world and have fun. But when you realize that, wow, I can actually do this because he's erasing my record of wrong. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Faithful yeah. in that he does it consistently, just in that he does it based upon the work of the cross. And, you know, this is why I think that most people get stuck in cycles of sin because they're stuck in cycles of hopelessness. 
Mm. They, they don't believe they're forgiven. They don't believe that they can be forgiven. I found the greatest breakthrough in my life in terms of holiness came when I caught this revelation of, wow, he's, he's really not holding anything against me. If I repent, repentance is key, though, the scripture, that's right. part of the act of faith. And some might say, well, I thought it was not by works. Well, the scripture says not by works, but by faith. So we know that at least in terms of biblical perspective, that faith is not counted as a work. And we see that very clearly when the scripture talks about the difference between the two. But when you put your hope in God and your faith in him, mm -hmm. that's what he gives you to the nature and the power of the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Jesus told us to abide. Yeah. And if we abide in him, we bear fruit. And in that connection with him comes this beautiful expression of his nature and character in our everyday lives. I want to read a couple portions of scripture. Everything I gave was Bible-based. Um, I, I didn't give, have time to give you kind of the references there. But uh, like as we mentioned earlier, I do have a channel um, always, always, always just riddled with scripture and founded upon scripture, the teaching. So Philippians 1.11 says this. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. What is the fruit? What comes out of my salvation? The Bible says the righteous character produced in your life by Christ Jesus. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Lots packed into this one verse. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. So in other words, what he's talking about here is something that comes about as a result of being saved. Again, religious minds get it backwards. We think salvation comes about as a result of righteous character. Mm -hmm. When righteous character comes about as a result of salvation, the righteous character of Christ, now watch this, produced in your life by who? By Jesus Christ. So the righteous character of Christ produced by Christ. I mean, think about the fact that the Bible very clearly tells us that Everything about the laws hangs upon two simple commands. Love God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus himself said this. Well, how can this be? Well, if I love God, I'm not going to commit idolatry. If I love God, I'm not going to blaspheme his name. If I love God, I'm going to follow his commands. That's what Jesus said. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. If I love my family, if I love my friends, if I love my neighbor, I'm not going to kill them. I'm not going to steal from them. I'm not going to be jealous of them. If, right. if I love my fellow man, I won't sin against them. If I love God, I won't sin against him. And the Holy Spirit wow. gives us all that we need. So, so think about this. The Holy Spirit gives us the love that we need that sets us free from sinful living. And that's produced by what? Living in him. If you mm -hmm. walk with the Spirit, you walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the desires of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the cravings of the flesh. So it's a matter of staying in step with him. And I think this is where we come into this aspect of rest. I mean, it's a lot to keep track of if you think that this is all entirely your responsibility. And and right. believe me, you do bear some responsibility in that you have a free will to exercise and God does hold you accountable for the decisions that you make. That's a fact. So we're not going to dismiss mm -hmm. that reality. But think about the fact that when I come to him and I'm fellowshipping with him and I'm resting in him, Mm -hmm. It is my rest in who he is that begins to produce his character and nature in me. So we come to God, right? We have this long list. I mean, Troy, I can't tell you how many times I've gone through the scripture and set it down and just put my hand on my face. I'm being serious. I'm not being dramatic. I, this is sincerely what I've done sometimes. I'll read the scripture. I'll put my hands over my face and I'll go, oh, I'll say, Jesus, there's so many ways that I'm not like you. Mm. Please make me like you. Please make me like you. And, and it's this, this pleading. It's like Romans 8, 26 and 27 talks about those deep groanings, the Holy Spirit praying for you, and he's bending you toward the will of the Father, like the psalmist yeah. wrote, incline my heart to your statutes. Just bend me toward your will. This is the surrendering of self, the surrendering of the will, the thousand deaths a day that come about as a result of love for Jesus. And so we come to him, and I come to him, and I look at the scripture, I'm going, okay, there's a lot to track here. There's a lot that I need to get into here. And I, I just compile sometimes in my head this long list. Okay, my prayer life needs work. My devotion to the word needs work. 
Um, my my patience needs work. My kindness needs work. My 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 love and my joy and my peace. Those all need work. And then maybe I should up my commitment to local churches a little bit more. Maybe I should work a little bit harder at studying the scripture for the lessons that I present. And then, oh my gosh, don't forget about everyday living. I could be a better husband. I could be a better dad. I could be a better brother, a better friend. And the list just begins to get longer and longer and longer. And then I start to wonder, well, did I worship long enough? Did I pray enough today? Do I pray often? often enough as that is. Do I do as Colossians says and do everything as unto the Lord? So how am I doing at work? Am I a good Christian testimony? And for that matter, what about my evangelism? What am I going to do about that if I'm not meeting my quota, or at least the quota that I imagine I should be meeting from right. week to week? And little by little, all of these things begin to pile up. And, and what happens is we get this long list, and then we start to look at the life of Christ and look at our lives and we say, my goodness, it doesn't match up and it becomes tedious. It becomes exhausting. It becomes this very specific system that we're trying to implement to make sure that we're meeting all of the different aspects. Um, how is my soul? How am I acting in my physical being? And then how am I taking care of my body? Now I got to throw that in there too, because the scripture says that my body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. How am I eating? Am I exercising? Am I really taking care of what I should be taking care of? What about my finances? Do those reflect Christian values in the way that I spend? And so it just all starts to become very overwhelming. And, and if you really stick to this for too long, you become very tense. Religious people are very tense just because the, the weight of the world is on their shoulder, at least the weight of their world. Responsibilities, fears, doubts, everything is on them. And so that it comes to this place where you've got to decide, do, 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 am I going to do this list alone? And, and how do I take care of all of this? Well, I think of Martha and Mary. Martha was busy preparing the meal for the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. Martha and Mary both wanted the same thing. They wanted to please Jesus. They just went about it in different ways. And so Martha wow. says, Jesus, don't you care that my sister's just sitting here with you. Mary's just sitting there chatting. I'm doing all this work. I'm preparing everything as it should be. And she's just sitting there. Martha fully expected. Let, let's get this clear. Martha fully expected for the Lord to say, you know what? You're right. Mary, this isn't right. Get, get over there and help Martha. That's what she was expecting Jesus to say. But that's not what he said. He said, you're worried about so many things. Mary has found the one thing that truly matters. And it's not going to get taken away from her. So how do we interpret this? Does this mean that we don't try to do that list? No, 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 no. It means that we accomplish that list through tending to his presence. Wow. When I plug into him, when I spend time with Jesus, when, when, I, when I'm truly connected, abide in the vine, you'll bear much fruit. All, all I have to do is abide. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm not responsible for making the daily decisions of holiness and choosing his word over my will and so forth. Yes, you make those decisions, but how do you get the strength to do that? How do you have the discernment to do that? And how do you remember to keep track of all these little things? It's grace, and that grace comes through time in his presence. Yeah. And when I begin to spend time in his presence, when I begin to connect with him daily, daily, out of that flows the fruit. Out mm. of that, the issues are taken care of. Out of that comes the foundation for my everyday living. Here's how you can tell the difference between what's religious and what's spiritual. The difference between what's religious and what's spiritual is the religious system is always very complex. The spiritual mm -hmm. is always very simple. Yeah. It's not easy, but simple. Jesus <laughs> said the way to follow him is pretty simple, but it's not easy. You got to die to yourself. Well, that's pretty simple, mm -hmm. but it's not easy. And so how do we do this? You just... Constantly choose Jesus over self. Constantly choose his word over your will. How do we surrender? Someone asked me that. How do I surrender? Well, it's simple. Surrender is not a feeling. It's obedience. Right. Surrender is every time I say no to sin and yes to Jesus. Surrender mm -hmm. is every time I say no to self and yes to Jesus. No to the world and yes to Jesus. No to the devil and yes to Jesus. And in doing this, now the character and the nature of Christ begin to develop naturally. Now I'm not trying to do things that are outside my nature. Now my nature is being transformed and, and, and my actions have no choice but to change mm. because, it, because I can't do outside of my nature. And once my nature is taken care of, once my heart is dealt with, once God begins to really perfect me internally, well, the expressions of my being reflect heavenly things, not earthly wow. things. And that's where the true transformation comes is when you realize I just have to get to Jesus. 
I'll yeah. give you this illustration that I use. Um, imagine before you, and and I, I don't drink alcohol, not even in, a, in the slightest um, measurement. Uh, it's just not something, that's just something I don't do. But picture, if you will, a pyramid of wine glasses, okay? You got a pyramid of wine glasses and you have one water source. Well, you could make the decision to fill it up from the bottom, the middle, the top, And let's say all these wine glasses represent the different aspects of your life. Let's say at the bottom, not the base, but the the lesser things, that's uh, finances, your job, your career, your education, all of that. And then then another tier would be your service, your your charity work, what you do, how you perform for uh, the kingdom. And then your relationships, and then your prayer life, devotion to the word, and then your time with God, right? That's the very top. What we try to do in our lives, we take that water source— we try to fill one jug at a time. Well, well, let me just invest a little in my marriage, a little bit of my finances, a little bit here and there. And, and that's good. You should be investing in those things. But the problem is um, it's going to get complicated real fast with trying to keep track, track of what's filled and what's not. Mm. So, so what is the simplest way to do this? The simplest way is to address the main thing, the very top, right. and that begins to flow into all the different aspects or the different wine glasses that represent the different aspects of your life. What's that first thing? That first thing is my relationship with my connection with and my surrender to Jesus. And if I'm pouring in that top glass, it's going to overflow and touch every other aspect of my life. It may take some time to do so, but it's going to touch every aspect of my life. Wow. Yeah. That, uh, the story of Mary and Martha, one of the things I love about it is the fact that, you know, because of Martha's proximity to Jesus, she couldn't hear Jesus. She couldn't hear mm-hmm. what he was teaching, but then also she couldn't hear, you know, his guidance or direction or his answer, whatever it may have been, you know, but Mary could hear him directly, you know, because she was there listening. And and, and obviously Mary at some point was probably going to get up and help make food or whatever, you know, or <laughs> at, at some point she was going to, you know, help Martha, I'm sure, but might have been the next day, who knows, but but, you know, I think the same thing applies to us is that I think what happens when we're coming at it from that religious perspective of we're looking at that long list of things like I have to do this and this and this and this and this is like we are putting the weight on ourselves to make sure we get everything done. You know, and even from a ministry perspective, I think that list right. is even longer, you know, sometimes for someone in ministry, because I think a lot of times your work is so intertwined with your relationship with God. And with what God expects and what God desires, you know, that it's like you feel like even more so that weight of I have to get all these things right or else I'm affecting, you know, more people than just myself, you know, if I get this wrong. And so, you know, I think the answer is we can either look at that list all day long or we can know and believe that we have a helper, the Holy Spirit, you know, and that that nearness when we abide in Jesus and we're abiding in him. It's like if you're missing something, the Holy Spirit is going to point it out to you. Mm-hmm. You know, he's the one that's going to catch the things that fall through the cracks. He's the one that's going to catch you when you fall. You know, he's the one that's going to be there to say, hey, you're neglecting your spouse, <laughs> you know, or hey, you're neglecting time in the word, you know, or hey, just come into my presence. Come worship me. Let's spend time together because that's what you need right now. You know, so it's like you you have someone else there who's way smarter than you, way wiser <laughs> way, you know, way more intelligent, you know, in, yeah. in, in every sense and, and can see the full picture, can see everything, can see the outcome of, of you going any which direction. You know, he knows he knows exactly what we need to do, exactly where we need to go. And, and it's like if we don't come into that place of abiding in Jesus, we don't come into his presence. We're not you know, we're not situated in him. Yeah, we are going to be carrying that list. We are going to be doing the list ourselves. We're going to be carrying that weight. But he wants to carry it. You know, he he wants to be the one that's like, hey, I've got you, you know, in the midst of all these things. I've got you. I'm holding on to you. You know, and I think that's where it, it really comes down to, you know, the difference between it's almost like the difference between Peter and John, you know, where Peter was always like, Jesus, I'm going to do this. You know, don't worry. I've got it, Jesus. You know, and John was just like, Jesus loves me. <laughs> You know, I know Jesus loves me. At least he, lo- you know, I, at least I know right. that, you know, and it's just, I, you know, it's, I don't know. It's like, I, I think there's, there's a, there's an aspect of Peter that yes, we are supposed to be like, you know, there's an aspect of that where it's like, yeah, we're supposed to be fiery for the Lord, passionate for the Lord at the, you know, 
in the right ways, we're supposed to say yes, we're supposed to step out of the boat when he calls us, you know, like, but at the same time, it's like all of the strength to do those things can't be relying on, you know, the strength can't be coming from us. It has to be coming from him. It has right. to be coming from our time with him. And man, as you're describing that list, yeah, you're definitely uh, <laughs> making me think about the list in my own mind. And I, I think, you know, David, um, I really honestly believe that, you know, one of the reasons why we call it the spirit of religion sometimes is because the enemy has been able to take this weight of religion or whatever, however you want to phrase it, you know, but this, this perspective, this religious perspective, you know, on the gospel and on our Christian walk. And he's been able to steal people's joy. He's been able to steal people's rest, their assurance. He's been able to steal people's peace, you know, and ultimately their time. Cause if you don't have these things, you're spending your time looking for them. You know, you're spending your time trying to figure out what do I need to do to make this work? But when you have it, then you can just do what God's asking you to do. You know, then you can right. just, and anyways, so yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I'm, 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 I'm glad you said that. Two things you said that I think were super key. Number one, you talked about the advantage of having the voice of the Holy Spirit directing your every moment. I mean, what greater advantage could we possibly have in life than someone who's all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent, guiding us every step of the way? So if yeah. you have the voice of the Holy Spirit directing you, I mean— that's the great advantage in life of the believer. Now, here he is reminding you, John 14, 26. So he reminds and he reveals. He's constantly with us on this journey, directing us. I think of how the, the apostles tried to go into Asia and the Holy Spirit prevents them. So he directs as we go. But as long as we have the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives, there's always this safety net, if you will. Mm -hmm. And if we miss something or forget something or do something wrong, He's right there to correct. This is why if people ignore that voice and they stifle the voice of the Holy Spirit in their lives, that's where they're in real danger. Because right. the longer you ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit, the harder he becomes for you to hear. Mm -hmm. And we, this is not that he gives up on you because he doesn't. This is just the reality of hardening your heart against his voice. And so that should put the fear of God in us, recognizing that there are consequences to ignoring his voice uh, long term, even short term for delay is disobedience. But still, we have to be committed to that voice. The second thing you were talking about that I think is really important that you touched on is this idea that the enemy really does attack the believer in these areas. And this is one of his most powerful tactics is this religious ideology, this religious mindset, this filter through which you see all things. And it really perverts and skews even any biblical truth. I mean, I remember there was mm -hmm. there were a couple of years, Troy, like two years, I battled with this severe anxiety over a portion in the book of Romans where Paul the Apostle talks about vessels of wrath. Now, wow. at the time, because of my lack of study, I didn't recognize that Paul the Apostle was talking about the nation of Israel being the gateway through which the gospel would eventually come to the Gentiles, that they became vessels of wrath in the sense that it was their rejection of the Messiah that ultimately brought about God's plan. So God worked through that. No, what did I take it as? Oh, I'm a vessel of wrath created for hell, and there's nothing that I can do even if I repent or attempt to come to the Lord. I've just wow. been chosen for wrath, and that's that just settles that. So now I'm dealing with that. The enemy takes the word and twists it, and that's how powerful his assaults are because, I mean, we're only going to believe what's believable, and this is why mm -hmm. he takes portions of the Scripture and is able to twist them. That's what he did to Eve. First, he questioned the word. Did he really say that? And then he perverts yeah. it. And so then he says, no, um, what he's saying is not true, for you will be as gods and so forth. And so that's the real battle is that the enemy tries to remove that beauty and that power of the word from our lives through deception. But here's mm -hmm. the thing. A lie only becomes deception when you believe it. So right. if I stand here and I say, and I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm saying, hey, I'm wearing a yellow shirt. Well, very clearly you can look at me and see that I'm not wearing a yellow shirt. I'm wearing a black shirt. But if I'm able to convince you of that, then you're deceived. So if the lie is not believed, it's not deception. The problem is believers aren't filtering through what the enemy is attacking them with, with the word of God. They just mm -hmm. accept the thoughts. They just accept the ideas. And so there's no filter. I, I call right. it the filter of truth. Ask yourself, is this biblically true mm -hmm. in every sense of the, the entirety of the thought? And if it is okay, then I allow it and I embrace it. If it's not, I reject it. Right. And that really is the essence of spiritual warfare, which is the fight to believe God's truth 
over the enemy's lies. And these are spiritual attacks too. Because out of this system of religion, out of this, this, this ideology that the enemy uses as a construct in our minds, a pattern of thought, if you will, out of this comes all sorts of attacks, including accusation, where the enemy mm -hmm. will bring up your past again and again. Now, here, here's where it gets really deep. I'm going to expose the enemy right now. Here's where it gets really deep. Because there are some believers who believe they're forgiven of the eternal penalty of their sin, but they've somehow embraced this idea that they deserve to be under this lifelong punishment for what they've done. Now, I understand mm -hmm. there are natural consequences that occur in our world. Like if you murder someone, you're probably going to spend the rest of your life in prison. Even after the Lord forgives you, there's still systems of man uh, that we have to submit to. But beyond things like that, this idea that we have to choose misery in order to please God is just nonsense. I mean, the religious mind actually believes that the more miserable I am, the more pleased God must be with me. And right. so it's like this idea, well, his lashes weren't enough, so I'm going to have to take emotional and mental lashes every day for the rest of my life. I'll feel guilty if I enjoy blessings. I'll feel guilty if I get a good job. I'll feel guilty if I receive any expression of the favor of God in my life. So instead, let me just keep my head low. Let me let me just walk with the weight on my shoulders. Yeah, I'm forgiven. Yeah, I'm redeemed. Yeah, I belong to God. But part of my identity is still wrapped up in what I did. Part of my identity is still wrapped up in my mistakes. I'm still going to... Mm -hmm allow for that torment of what I've done, the shame of what I've done to just be with me for the rest of my life. And this is the problem is people aren't willing to enjoy the blessings of God. They aren't willing to enjoy their salvation because they think that God is pleased with them being miserable for a sin that they've been forgiven of because they imagine this is their way of sacrificing themselves. They imagine that they are purchasing their forgiveness through mm. their misery. Wow. And because of this, they stay bound. Let me just break it to you. If you are bound, you're not living the Christian life. I know that sounds harsh. I know that's that that seems a little out there, but I'm giving you the biblical truth. And that doesn't mean we're not going to struggle. We are going to struggle, but I'm saying the standard of the Christian life to which we must aspire is one of victory, not one of necessarily perfect circumstances all the time. Jesus said in this world, you'll have tribulation. Jesus talked about us having persecution. Paul teaches us to live abased and abound. And so, of course, we know there's different ways of living and different circumstances, trials, tragedies. Of course, they'll come. Life can't always be 100 percent ideal. There will be issues that arise. But I'm talking about that internal victory that no matter what you're facing, there's love, joy, peace flowing right. out of you, even in the midst of trials. And sometimes we don't allow ourselves to have that peace or that joy because of a sin we committed in our past that God has forgiven. But religion tells us, no, you can't be happy. You can't have joy. You must remain sorrowful and miserable because of what you've done. But the gospel is, in part, telling us that we can have joy because of what Christ has done. So right. what you did does not have more power than what Jesus did. Right. Your sin is not more powerful than the blood of Jesus. His hand is not too short that it cannot save. I'm not talking about a life where we say, oh, you know, I'm just kind of coasting through life. I got this weight on my shoulders. Every day is just a battle. And it's almost like we wear battles like they're a badge. And I understand Paul the Apostle in some sense in, in one of his epistles did brag about the things he suffered for the Lord. So I'm not saying that suffering doesn't have its rewards. But what I am saying is this mindset where we bring upon ourselves unnecessary suffering that doesn't bring glory to God simply because we believe that's the more spiritual thing to do. Wow. And it's like the, the it's like the Olympics of suffering. And, and, and if I can just talk about how how you know how embattled I am. Oh, I'm just under attack all well, because you know the enemy knows I'm a target. Well, yeah, I get that, but how can the enemy really take any power over you when you're walking in the spirit? Right. So this idea that that the more embattled I am, the more struggle, the more struggles I face, that somehow the more spiritual I am, to some degree, yes, that can be true. But if you're bringing that upon yourself through ideas like, oh, I don't deserve joy, I don't deserve peace, well, now that's just religion. And again, I'm balancing that, of course, by saying that there is some joy and suffering for the Lord when it's necessary, but we sometimes bring unnecessary suffering suffering on ourselves simply because we think it's more spiritual when it's not. Right. And one of the things that I found is that even when the Lord is asking you to walk through a season of like a, a trial or a tribulation or suffering for the sake of Christ is like his supernatural joy is still going to be there. 
Right. You know, it's like, yeah, I might be not be happy to be in this situation, but I've got this supernatural joy in my heart, you know, that the Lord's presence is there. This is one of the things, uh, and I think you hit the nail on the head. This is one of the things the Lord has had to show me personally when it comes to the devil bringing those accusing thoughts and even using the word of God against me, you know, mm-hmm. and it's like, I think the, the test should be, okay, let me look, let me look at, let me examine how, uh, what fruit is coming out of this thought that I'm believing, right? Like, is it causing me peace or is it causing me anxiety and stress? You know, is it causing me joy or is it causing me depression? You know, it's like, so now that I've examined it, I can look at what scripture says about the fruit of the spirit, love. And joy, if, peace. If, if I may, Troy, I want to just interject this right there before, um, because I, because I can already see it. Someone right. taking that clip of you and totally twisting what you're saying. <laughs> um, no, we are yeah. not saying that the word of God will never pierce the heart. Yes. Right. The word of God will convict. Yes, the word of God will confront you. So, so I already know Troy. What some people would, not that yeah, you're too concerned with that anyway. But I wanted to I, interject that there. <laughs> yes, there are times when I'm reading the word and I'm deeply, heavily convicted. So we're mm-hmm. not saying that. Oh, if that scripture doesn't make you feel good, ignore it. That's not what we're saying. We're right. saying that the enemy can sometimes torment you by twisting the word and mm-hmm. bringing forth doctrines that are not entirely biblical and ultimately causing you to suffer under the power of religious mindset because we don't understand what the word is actually saying. Right, exactly. And I think I think for someone who's walked with the Lord for a long time, it should be, you know, and I'm saying this, it should, and I don't know if it's not always going to be true. It should be true that you can see the difference between the peace of the world and the peace of God. You know, mm-hmm. like the, the peace of, oh, this is making me happy. This is, you know, making my flesh happy versus, no, God's presence is here and I have his peace and I can, you know, his supernatural peace. So so there's a difference there. If And what I'm saying is if you examine Whether or not this lie, you know, it is a lie, obviously, but whether or not this thing, this thought that you're believing that, you know, in some cases, you know, that obviously it's twisted scripture. In other cases, it's just a straight out lie that, that, you know, from your pastor or whatever. But it's like if you can examine that and see, is this producing the real peace of God in my life? You know, then I may not have to go search the scripture and examine if it's true or not. But if it's not, if it's producing something else, you know, like. There's just anxiety all around it. You know, it's like then we need to take what we're hearing. Like you said, David, we need to we need to go look at what the word says about it. And we need to measure it against it and see, has the devil per- perverted something? You know, mm-hmm. has he taken something that was was true and perverted it? Has he caused me to believe a lie? You know, and then once that happens, then we can submit to the Lord, you know, and then we can resist the devil. Then we can, we can say, Lord, I'm sorry for believing this lie. I have been believing this. It's not, it's not what your word says. And I'm going to start believing this over here. You know, I think there's so much power that comes in what you were saying earlier, David, where you're looking at the life of Jesus and you're saying, Lord, I want, you know, I want to be like this. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I've seen is, uh, just the fire of the Holy spirit, you know, specifically one of the most powerful times that I've had with the Holy Spirit, you know, and experiencing his fire has been when I am just praying for purity. When I'm just mm-hmm. saying, Lord, everything that's in my heart, like I want you to change it so it looks like yours. You know, like everything in my heart that's not from you, whether I'm willing to admit that that I'm wrong about it right now or not, what it doesn't matter. Like get me to that point, you know, like, Lord, get me to that point. I want to be, I want my heart to look like yours. It's like, that is when I see the most power of the Holy Spirit in my life personally, making it, coming in and changing me, you know, when he comes in and he says, okay, now I'm going to start working, you know, and it's the same thing you said earlier. It's like you deciding, like, I don't want to live by my nature any longer. I want to live by the nature of Christ. So you're making that decision, not my will, but your will, Lord, you know, and it's like, if we, if we don't, come to a point where we're making that decision really every day, (laughs) you know, then we are susceptible to those lies. We're in a place where we're, you know, where when a lie comes along, we're going to grab it for one reason or another, you know, like the devil's going to promise like, Hey, if you believe this, it's going to cover this past hurt, you know, it's going to make you feel better about that. Or if you believe this, then it's going to help you to stand up against this person that's, you know, treating you wrongly, whatever it may be. Like there's a million situations but it's like he's going to use the circumstance to bring a lie in. And then we're going to grab onto that because we like it. But the 
you know, this gets back to the same point that, that we were both making earlier is that the Holy Spirit is the helper. And when we are surrendering our heart, submitting our heart to him, he's going to say, wait a minute. You know, no, that's not what I said. <laughs> that's not right. what the word says. You know, he's going to say, wait a minute. I know that sounds good right now. I know it sounds like that's going to help, but it's not. You know, that's a lie. And then that is where, you know, in that place, that's where it's like then, you know, it, it's like we're, you know, it's like the Holy Spirit is wanting to constantly just get us free. You know, as long as we have an enemy, we're going to need him to, to be getting us free. You know, we're going to need him to be, you know, Jesus said it like this. He said, uh, it's better that I go away so that the Holy Spirit comes. And when he comes, he said, he, he's going to remind you of everything I've said, and he's going to lead you into all truth. So it's like, why would we need him to lead us into all truth if, if we're not, if someone else is not trying to lead us into a lie, right? You know, even when we're reading scripture t- sometimes, even when we're, when we're t- taking a scripture and trying to apply it to our lives, the devil is going to do anything he can to try to pervert that. No, it's true. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what he does. And that's, again, that comes back to the essence of what it is to have a religious spirit. So so in, right. in, in Christianity, in Christian culture, it's almost become common practice to just use the word religion as a criticism or an insult with anyone that we disagree with. So somebody teaches something that we don't like, oh, you're just religious. So, okay, well, that's not really what religious means when we use religious in the negative sense. Again, there's a positive side uh, to the right. word religion, depending upon the context and how it's used. Again, the scripture talks about what true religion is. But when it comes down to what religion, the negative side is, sometimes, again, we just kind of use it. We attach it to people that, well, they teach something that we don't like. So let me just call you religious. Or we'll say that people who insist upon biblical accuracy are religious. That that I've never been too fond of because you know people use that on me. When I insist on biblical accuracy in certain topics, people say, well, that's just religious. I'm like, no, that's biblical. Yeah. So being <laughs> biblical is not being religious. Being religious, again, comes back to this mindset of imagining that you can earn these things or earn God's uh, pleasure or earn salvation on your own. That And again, it either produces spiritual pride or absolute devastation and lack of hope. Either mm-hmm. way, it's not a good result. Um, right. So again, it comes down to these very simple principles of, of acknowledging that I need to rest in Him. I need to trust in that finished work of the cross. That way I, I have that assurance. And then I need to surrender to the process of perfection that He might complete the work in me while still striving for holiness in my life. But again, it's 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 really important just to know Biblically speaking, what everything means, where everything kind of neatly falls into place. And I right. hope that we did a, a good job here today of communicating these truths. Yeah, I feel like you did, David. I mean, I, I think this is really this is really going to help some people. It's helping me, honestly. So <laughs> I need to be reminded of this, too. Uh, but would you uh, before we uh, end this video, would you just pray for those listening specifically if you could pray for the lies of the enemy to be shown for what they are? Because I think obviously we can't accept the Lord's help, you know, in helping to correct something if we're not willing to admit or if we can't see that it's wrong, you know, or if we can't see that it's not coming from him. Um, and then on top of that, just uh, just for the Holy Spirit to set people free, you know, and 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 even for the grace of God to be revealed for what it really is, you know, because I think at the bottom of, of all of this is that issue of. Are we really seeing, you know, Scripture's version of grace and truth, or are we looking at our own version? So if you could pray for those listening, that would be be awesome. Cast all your cares on Him, for He cares for you. As we pray right now, I'm going to ask that the Holy Spirit would begin to stir that peace within your soul. There may be someone watching right now. You've been dealing for years with fear, shame, guilt, paranoia, maybe even spiritual pride. Maybe you've imagined for a long time that your relationship with God is like a ladder, that every good day is a step toward him, every bad day is a step back, when all the while he is gracious. He is faithful even when we are not, for he cannot deny who he is, is what the scripture says. I'm going to pray with you right now. And as we pray, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to begin this work of renewing your mind by the word. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift that one to you now who is calling out to you. 
And Holy Spirit, I pray for illumination of the word. Touch their minds, I pray. And Lord, let your word go forth like a hammer and shatter mindsets of the world. Father, I pray that your peace would begin to flood them now by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your kindness toward us. And I pray now, Lord, peace. Peace to come upon your people. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to say it because you believe it. Say, amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Man, I appreciate you being on today. And I'm super excited about sharing this. Uh, this is my favorite topic, honestly. <laughs> One of my favorite topics. So, um, man, I just appreciate you so much. Y'all, please go subscribe to David's channel, Encounter TV on YouTube. If you have not subscribed, at least go watch some of his videos. And then after that, you'll want to subscribe. Um, so go check it out. There's a link. I'm going to put a link below this video as well on YouTube to make it easy to do that. Um, David, again, thank you so much. And to everyone uh, listening and watching, I love y'all so much and I'll see you next time.